I got started doing this high conflict stuff with legal disputes, and it spread to all types of legal disputes, civil cases, even some criminal cases. And then I started hearing from workplace and human resource uh, professionals were asking for help, managers, government agencies. So what we find is there's really mental health issues in a whole range of settings in today's world. And of course, part of what we're looking at now is the mental health issues of people that are spilling into the public through public violence. So hopefully I can tie together all of this and also give some tips for things to do and not do in your practice. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background on basic mental health issues and types of mental health issues and how they impact uh, litigation. And when people talk about mental illness, they don't really say what they're talking about. So let me start with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. Most people really tend to think that's mental illness and everything else isn't. You know, everybody gets depressed sometimes, anxious sometimes. That's not a mental illness, people say. Um, and personality disorders, what's interesting is legal professionals don't treat personality disorders as a mental illness. And so when you get into, say, a case where there's, uh, it's a criminal case, and you're looking at, is this person competent to stand trial? And I've read cases, and I have them in my book, High Conflict People and Legal Disputes, where, yes, they've been found competent to stand trial because they're not psychotic. They just have a narcissistic and antisocial personality disorder and that's not deemed a mental illness. So let's talk about these a little bit. By the way, I want to mention I'm very comfortable with questions at any time. So if there's something that gets triggered, I'm okay with addressing that right at the time. We have a relatively small group, so it's easier to you know, have a little more questions and comments. But let me talk first about schizophrenia. So 30 years ago, I worked in psychiatric hospitals. I became a family, I became a lawyer 26 years ago. Wow, okay. <laughs> Before that, when I was a mental health professional for 12 years, part of that time I worked in psychiatric hospitals. And I worked with people with schizophrenia, chemical dependency, depression, uh, suicide issues, a, lot, a whole range of things. But it was interesting to learn about people with schizophrenia. Really generally um, confused, frightened. Schizophrenia is where you have delusions, you see people that aren't there, or you have hallucinations. That's more often you hear voices that aren't there. And they're really in the person's head. What's important, I think, in terms for legal professionals is understanding people with schizophrenia have a wide range. There's people who are taking medication, who have a job, and are generally functioning okay. And yet they have schizophrenia. So you have that at one end, you have at the other end people that can't manage life at all. They're majority of the time under the influence of, of uh, psychotic thoughts, et cetera. Um, a lot of the people you see now that are homeless on the streets, uh, a, a sizable percent have schizophrenia. And the problem is they won't take medication. And when they're not taking their medication, they have hallucination. You see them talking to the buildings and things like that. For many of them, if they take their medication, they actually can be sharper and more in touch and more calm but they don't want to take medication. And so there's a certain percent of people with schizophrenia that are out in public, and occasionally they become dangerous to the people around them. 
Now, most of you as lawyers are probably not having many cases with someone with schizophrenia. When I was um, in law school, I did the civil clinic. This is at University of San Diego. There was a civil clinic, and I represented some patients in psychiatric hospitals in the hearings to see do they need to be held against their will or can they be released. And I remember one case, it was kind of humorous. My client kind of went in and out of being um, well-organized and sharp. And I really studied the case. I uh, went to the hospital the day before the hearing, read the file, really became familiar with it. And the next morning, they hold the hearing in the hospital. There's a hearing officer comes. And I sit down, and there's tables, and I sit down beside my client, and I've got tons of notes. I am organized. And the nursing staff told me afterwards they were really afraid I was going to get this guy out. <laughs> So I go into my presentation, and after about the second, se second sentence, he starts yelling at the judge <laughs> and swearing and all of that, and, and I couldn't get him to stop. And the judge says, I think I have enough information to make my decision. <laughs> and so he got to stay a little bit longer. Um, but when you're dealing with people with these, with what's commonly known as mental illness or psychotic disorders, you're really dealing with people that don't have a lot of control. On the other hand, you're generally dealing with people who aren't a threat, who aren't violent. They're much more of a problem for themselves. They do have a heightened risk of suicide. They have a heightened risk of substance abuse. They often use that to cope. Uh, but if you do have someone like this, it's important to know that there's a presumption in the public eye that this is who are the crazy shooters out in the world, are people with schizophrenia. And the research I look at says that yes, about 20% of people that do these larger shootings, three or more people, it's called a mass uh, shooting, um, have a psychotic disorder, but that's not most of them. Anyway, so that's that personality. That's that issue. It's not personality, it's a diagnosis. Um, and it comes out of nowhere. You don't know this is going to happen. It generally comes late teens to early 30s. You don't know when it's going to happen. Since people are concerned about violence these days, it's helpful to know you're not going to be able to make a list of all the people with schizophrenia so that you don't give them guns. You don't know that they're a violent person or even have schizophrenia sometimes until they do something super dramatic. And people say, you know, he was starting to change. He was starting to become more withdrawn, stop being as social, and then he went out and killed some people. You often don't know this is somebody who's been planning for 10 or 20 years. That's not people with schizophrenia. So I just want to mention that because people think, oh, we can just identify all those folks and don't give them weapons. You, you don't know who it's going to be until early 30s. That's how surprising that can be. So that's, it's less predictable than I think people want it to be. Anyway. People with schizophrenia, about 1% of the U.S. population, and probably all countries, uh, all, all cultures have some people with schizophrenia. About 1% of the population, pretty small percent. And not particularly violent, that's important to know. A few are, but most aren't. So mood disorders, next mental health issue. Um, and let me, let me back up. If you're working with clients who are in their 20s, then they start changing, their behavior starts changing, they start being odd, they start socially withdrawing, et cetera. You might be seeing someone who's starting to have an episode, a first episode of schizophrenia. Um, once people are into their mid-30s and older, it's extremely rare you're going to see that. 